Well, good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here today. I've enjoyed my time in Colorado. I have to admit it's a little bit tough to get used to this altitude. I live at about 700 feet. So it took me a couple days to get rid of my headache. But I'm feeling good today. I'm glad to be here. God bless you. You know, a lot of people ask to, to, to put your uh, accomplishments down when they introduce you. And I said, well, you know, one of my accomplishments is that I'm pretty proud of is that I flunked sixth grade in reading and spelling. I was on probation in college. I graduated college without a, without a major or a minor. The most courses I have in any one subject are in early childhood development. So I was well prepared for my career in business. <laughs> but I want to talk to us today about being prepared and how God prepares us. Um, it, it is an honor to be here. You know, did anybody ever read the Randy Elkhorn books? He's got a couple of great books. He has a book on heaven. And uh, it's a phenomenal book. It's, I call it the definitive work on heaven. If you've not read it, I, I, I encourage you to read it. But one of the things he does in that book is he talks about these two astronauts that prepare, were preparing to go to Mars. They spent a decade preparing for their trip to Mars. So they're, they're finally in the spacecraft, they take off, they're breaking Earth's atmosphere and they're heading toward Mars and the one astronaut looks at the other one and goes, so, what do you know about Mars? You know, they spent all their time preparing but they didn't really know a lot about where they were going. And you know, a lot of times that's what happens with us in the marketplace calling. We talk a lot about the calling but let's do a little, let's, let's be business people for a minute. Let's do a little research on what's going on in the marketplace. If marketplace is a calling, what is actually happening in that calling? Let's see what happens here. So marketplace trends. What are the marketplace trends in the, in the world right now? So look at the quote at the bottom. And it's a quote that, that, I, that I say and it's something I've done quite a bit of research on, and I believe we're living in a two-decade period where we're going to see more businesses start in number than all the businesses that have started in number since the beginning of the world. That's quite a statement. We're going to see more businesses start in number in a two-decade period than all the businesses that have started in number since the beginning of the world. Now, why is that? Well, I heard Craig this morning talk about cell phones, you have a cell phone so you can tweet. I could tell you that, you know, in the countries that I visit around the world now, everybody has a cell phone. You can't go anywhere and not get cell coverage anymore. I mean, there's places in the United States I don't get coverage, but when I'm overseas, I get coverage almost all the time. Cell phones are everywhere. People can communicate now for the first time in history. About three or four years ago, Kenya started a internet or phone currency called M-Pesa. You can actually take a micro loan out on the phone. You can collect your money, your currency on your phone, and you can pay the loan back on your phone. You don't ever have to go to the bank. So now people have access to currency for the first time in the history of the world. Poor people, people all over the world, developing nations, actually have access to trading in the capital. These things are happening. Another thing that's happened in the last 100, 150 years, 200 years, is life expectancy has gone from about 45 to about 75 to 80. So in a very short period of time, life expectancy in the world has, has gone, has ramped up rapidly. We now have over 7 billion people on the earth. I heard a statistic one time that there's more people alive than have lived. So all these factors are, are creating an opportunity for more commerce. This is something that's happening. So when you do a little research and you say, okay, what else, what else is happening that's, that's responding to the marketplace? So the quote there says, 15 years ago, you would have had a hard time finding a mission group that had a business as mission arm or an arm that actually was focused on the marketplace. 15 years ago, almost no missions group had that. Now it's almost impossible to find one that doesn't. That's a huge shift in trend. That's a huge shift in activity. People are responding to this, what's going on. Uh, some of the things that have happened just this year that I've actually had a chance to be a part of 
uh, Charleston Southern University has an event now, a leadership event on the marketplace calling. Uh, there's a group here in um, Colorado Springs called Emerge. It's a YWAM group. They're trying to become the first self-funded YWAM base in the world. They're actually trying to raise money, earn money by doing their missions in a way with aquaponics, raising produce with a, in a greenhouse. They have a business conference every year. Uh, Kazakhstan, I was just in Kazakhstan this summer with first generation believers. What their, their focus is is how to empower the, the workers in the marketplace there in Kazakhstan. The president of Kazakhstan has done research. They want their country to be one of the top 10 economies in the world. That's his goal. He made a statement after the research, we want to take on Protestant work values and ethics in our country because those are the countries that prosper. The president of that country made that statement on national television. We want to take on Protestant work values and ethics. Well, someone teaches how to do it. These are doors that are opening and are powerful all over the world. We started something in Europe called the Christian European Economic Summit two years ago. We wrote a declaration on the marketplace, what, what a marketplace believer, a marketplace company should do. Two countries have adopted that declaration as an attitude or a foundation for their, the, to write their laws on business. This has happened in a couple of years. Things are moving very, very rapidly. Partners Worldwide is a group that we work with in Grand Rapids, Michigan. They've helped start over 10,000 businesses globally. They have small business groups, kind of like church business groups around the world, support groups. One of their groups that Partners Worldwide is in India, and I was able to work with the, the leader there in India. Four years ago, we had 60 people meeting in Hyderabad is in a work group, and they came up with a concept called the six by six, which is six people meet for six months over some topics, one spiritual leader, one, one business leader, and they have to duplicate themselves every six months. They have to break in half every six months and start another group. They're in five countries now. They have over 2,500 members in, in four years. That's pretty, pretty expansive growth, isn't it? There's a group called Open Networks. They, there's 700 businesses in this network that are in almost very difficult places in the world, the places that we don't get to talk about and you can't promote. 700 businesses all meeting together on a regular basis supporting one another. These are things that are emerging very rapidly. So one of the things that you can go to is I've met some people here, uh, the BAM Think Tank, Business as Missions Think Tank. If you look at that .org, we met about three years ago in Thailand. We had 12 or 14 working groups. I think I um, met one of your members here. I think Larry was, was part of that group. And we, we were writing white papers on what does it mean to be in the marketplace? What's going on? What, is it, what do we have to do to scale and duplicate businesses? How do you evaluate your effectiveness as a business in the marketplace? So it's, it's a great place to start some of your research if you, if you like the, uh, the, the information side of the marketplace movement called the BAM Think Tank. So growing market trends. So as a business person, I've had the opportunity to watch other markets start and not get involved, right? I've watched things happen and didn't get involved. I've had the business, I had the opportunity to follow someone else in a marketplace trend, and I've had the opportunity to lead. And the challenge here for us is, this is happening. This isn't a question that God is doing something in the marketplace. There's, it's, it's fact. God is doing something in the marketplace globally. The question is, are we gonna watch it? Are we gonna follow someone else leading? Or are we gonna lead? That to me is the question as a business person. There's a market trend going on. Opportunities are exploding all over the world. Here in Colorado, in Denver, you can see it's happening here. So it's not a question if, it's not a question what, it's a question it, what we're gonna do about it. Are we gonna be part of it? How does God want his people to respond to what, what's going on? What is the Lord asking us to do? So I asked myself that question a number of years ago. And um, 
the question that you've asked here on my call to the marketplace, and that was the, that was the topic that we talked about here, and, and I'm going to talk about I think that that's the wrong question. I think, you know, we have a saying in business that uh, there's no sense doing something right that you shouldn't be doing at all. Right? You work sometimes really hard to perfect something, but just really you shouldn't be doing it at all. So I think the question, like Tom said this morning, the question isn't, are we called? If you ask that question, you're, I think you're asking the wrong question. I mean, for me, I, didn't, I was fortunate. I didn't ask that question because I've always loved work. I started my first business when I was 14 years old, and I had 15 people working for me, bailing hay. I loved it. The harder it was, the more I liked it. We, one day, we, we worked two crews into the ground, and, you know, it was kind of a fun day for me. <laughs> you know, it's hot out there. You're throwing around 100-pound bales of hay, and you just wear out after a while. We had to take the guys home halfway through the day and get another crew. I love work. I feel God's pleasure when I'm working. So the question is not, are we called? The answer is yes. The question is, are we equipped? Are you equipped for what you're called to do? See, a lot of, a lot of what we do is we, we, we learn the scripture, which is good, but we learn it from a perspective of being a theologian, not a really practicing, practicing it. How do I apply it today? What is, how is it going to impact my work today? How is it going to impact my negotiations, how I treat my employees, how I treat my customers? What, am I, what is it going to do for me today as I go out into the workforce in the marketplace? So it's not, am I called? I really, really challenge, that's the wrong question. The question is, are you equipped? So I asked myself that question a number of years ago. Um, I was reading the Our Father, and I like the first in the Bible. I like when something first happens. So the first prayer that Jesus taught us was the Our Father. And in the Our Father, Jesus says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So we know that life starts with honoring God, right? I mean, we know that everything we do, first and foremost, is to honor the Father. Then Jesus says something really interesting next. He says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? And I ask myself, why is that the next sentence in that statement? Why is that the second sentence in that prayer? Did you ever ask that? Why is that the second sentence in that prayer? What was Jesus thinking when he said that? He says, when you pray, pray like this. And I like to ask Jesus that question. What were you thinking? Or what are you thinking? So what I did that day is I took a piece of paper and I rolled it up and I tied a ribbon around it and I stuck it by my prayer time in the morning, my Bible. I have a little chair I sit into my sunroom and pray in the morning. And uh, I said, God, that to me sounds like a mission statement. If I've ever heard a mission statement, that sounds like one. And what I know what I do with mission statements is I write them and then I write action items and I tell my employees what their actions are to help me fulfill my mission statement, right? That's what we do, isn't it? Well, if that's a mission statement, what are my action items? What do you want me to do to bring forth your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? What are my assignments? What do I need to do to prepare to do what you've called me to do? And then I just started seeking the Lord about that, and God began to give me things that were specific to what he had called me to do. So if that's true, that if God's mission statement is thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and the marketplace is exploding globally, then what are the needs in the marketplace right now in this global network? What are the things that we need? Well, we've talked about it. We need mentors. Let me, let me go to the quote here. Here's, here's a quote I started using overseas for about five years before I had the guts to say it in the United States. <laughs> and I started saying overseas, it says, I'm an elder in the marketplace appointed by God to equip the saints for the work of service. I was, is, I'm a fairly confident man, but I was afraid to say it here in the States because I was afraid about the reaction. Because I'm not saying that there are not other elders. There's not other markets. But we have this focus that this organization over here called the Little C, we call the church, is the kingdom of God. 
Well, God is raising up elders in the marketplace. Many of you here are elders. You have a, a very large sphere of authority and responsibility, or a smaller one. It doesn't matter, but you're leaders where you're at, and you need to be empowered in that calling. We need elders in the marketplace. We need people to be able to say that and confident in who they are. And if you understand that, then you're, then you're able to mentor. Now, I came up, I had to, I had to write definitions for myself for mentoring because um, I was always confused. Am I mentoring? Am I discipling? Am I coaching? Am I training? What am I doing? I, I, I just was confused. So I made up my own definitions. I said, mentoring to me is coaching, training, teaching a talent or a skill. It's transferring knowledge that I have on a topic. That's what I'm doing when I'm mentoring. When I'm discipling, what I'm trying to do is get my DNA into somebody. I'm not so much teaching them a skill, I'm trying to teach them how to be somebody. And I disciple a lot less people than I mentor. Mentoring is, is easy because it's, it's a transferable. Discipleship is a life walking with someone in life. You get your DNA into them, so they become somebody, so it doesn't matter what they do. They're going to reflect Christ wherever they're at because you've discipled them. You've taught them how to live. You've taught them how to respond. You've taught them how to seek God and hear God. It's a whole different thing. You get very few disciples. You can have a lot of mentors. At least that's my, my experience. So we need mentors. We need leaders willing to lead. We need people. See, I think we teach discipleship and mentoring wrong. Biblically, it appears to me that the mentor finds the mentee, that the discipler finds the disciple. And we tell young people, go out and find somebody to, and to, to follow them. Well, see, we should be, as leaders, we should be going out and finding young people and saying, I believe in you. I want to, I want to, I want to invest in your life. Will you follow me? Do we have that kind of confidence as leaders that we can say that I believe in you and I want, to, I want you to follow me. I want to teach you. I want to help you become all that God created you to be. I want to invest in you. Is that something we can do? Is that something we want to do? Let's turn it around. Let's take, the, let's take the lead. Let's be leaders. Let's be the leaders that God has made us to be. Right? Anybody agree with that? Yes. Want to see it. Want to see some changes. We need investors. There's a, there's a trend coming uh, right now. One of the things we do, I've been able to involve in 11 shark tanks now. We call them shark tanks, lion's dens, dragon's dens. I don't like any of those names. We have another one at our university we call the Hatch. We're birthing something. Another group we've called it the Genesis Seed. We're, we're creating something. So we need people to get engaged. I believe investment should be a, a relational or personal thing. I think we need to see more of that. We're investing in people's lives directly, invest in the things that God has called them to do directly. I think, that, I think that's a real biblical principle. We need investors. We need what's called B for T workers. Anybody heard of B for T before? Business for transformation. See, business is transformational. Business is holistic. When you do business God's way, what happens is everybody in the, everybody in the chain benefits. Business that's done the world's way, you take advantage of people. You try to get the best deal you can, and you don't care what happens to the other person. When you do business God's way, everybody in the chain prospers. Mars Corporation has an economic division, $32 billion company. They have something called the economics of mutuality. Basically, it's kingdom business. And what they have proven financially is when they do business God's way, those, division, those areas are more profitable. When you do things the way the Lord taught us to do them and you care about everybody in the chain, those channels, it's a $32 billion company that's now decided that if we do business God's way, we're more profitable. And now they're teaching other billion-dollar companies to do the same thing. Isn't that amazing? See, we need people that are willing to find out how to do things God's way and teach others. So there's, there's um, seven areas that, uh, that I think are... Not, it's not an inclusive list, but it's a list of things, and it's going to be part of our breakout here we're going to talk about. I'd like you to rate yourself where you feel like you're at in this. So there's seven areas. Do you really know you're called? Do you have the biblical knowledge? 
to support that calling? Do you understand the theology of work? I like to ask the question, where in the first place in the Bible is worship demonstrated? And when you think about worship, what goes into your mind? You think about adoration, right? You think about, you think about singing in church on Sunday. And that is a form of worship. But worship also is work. You know, Jesus created the heavens and the earth as an act of worship toward the Father. He did that for the Father, honoring the Father. And after six days of worshiping the Father, he called it work. I think creation is an act of worship. I can't see how it couldn't be. It's an act of worship. And then he called it work. Huh. First act of worship in the Bible is in Genesis 1, and they call it work. If you get, see, if you start with the wrong question, you end up with the wrong answer. Work is worship. Jesus proved that right at the beginning. Do you know you're a king and a priest? It's, we need to understand as leaders what it means to, to, to take a kingly role. And I like to tell people that it, we, I think um, Doug's going to come up and talk about success, evaluating success. And success to me is when I look behind me, what I'm going to see is peace and opportunity in the lives of the people that, that I've intersected with. My interchange with you in life should bring peace and opportunity into your life. There should be a, that, should be the, that should be the trail that follows me, peace and opportunity. As a king, a good king, that's what happens in the land. They bring peace and opportunity. You also have a priestly role. You have a right to go before God and pray for the people that God has put in your charge. And you actually have a responsibility. Do you understand that? Do you do it? Do you take advantage of that? Business is for the good of the community. We don't, under, we, we don't focus enough on the fact that we're there not just for the business to prosper, but we're there for the good of our community. God cares about cities. He cried over Jerusalem. That's another question I've asked God before. I said, Lord, when you were crying over Jerusalem, what were you crying about? What were you thinking when you cried over Jerusalem? What was going through your heart? I think one of the things that was going through his heart was, this isn't what I wanted. This isn't what I dreamed. This wasn't my plan. I had so much more in store for you, so much more in mind for what was going on. This isn't what I wanted. So we're going to have those worksheets. We're going to do that in a minute. And you're, I'm going to ask you to rate yourself on, on those seven areas, where you're at, and then we're going to talk about putting a plan together about how do you really get equipped? What do you need to do to equip yourself to be prepared for that calling, to really be a king and a priest in your market? So do you believe you're an elder in the marketplace? Do you really believe that? Do you believe that you're called? Are you empowered in that calling? God wants you to understand that. That's how he sees you. <clears throat> he sees you all as his sons. You're Jesus' brother and sister. If we're sons of the King of kings and the Lord of lords and, and Jesus is God's son, who are we? Jesus is our brother. Right? Are you affirmed in that calling? Have you had someone that came to you and affirmed you in that calling and prayed for you? You know, we pray for missionaries, we pray for all kinds of people. Have you been affirmed in that calling? Have you had someone that actually has a calling in the marketplace, pray for you and say, I, I recognize your mantle of authority and your calling, and I want to pray for you. I want you to understand that God has called you as a leader, that God has raised you up as a leader. And walk in confidence, walk in understanding that God has said, well done to you. I love the fact that there's seven places in the Bible where Jesus was affirmed. Jesus the man was affirmed. Jesus himself needed affirmation from the Father. Right? I used to think that God was doing that for the people, but then he said, well, all they heard was thunder. Jesus the man needed the Father to say, hey, son, I love you, and I'm proud of you. How much more so do we need it if Jesus needed it? Right? We need affirmation. We need it, we need it and we need to give it. So I'm excited about the opportunity for you guys not to think about are you called, 
I really want you to take that question out of your mind. I want you to think about, am I equipped? And what do I need to do to be equipped to do that all God that has me to do? So we're going to take some time now. you got some sheets on your table. And I'd like you to, to, to work together if you want, but I'd like you to go down those questions and rate yourself. Where are you at now in each one of those areas and your understanding and, you, and, you're, and feel like you're prepared to go do what God's called you to do? Okay?